Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental dash training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator Thank you so much for, for, for you know, keeping up with us. Uh, I want you to go ahead. We have uh, a, a distinguished speaker in our midst today. Uh, and um, Lainey, please go ahead and introduce her to uh, okay. our Okay, so Dr. Natalia D. Andraji. Dr. Natalia D. Andraji earned three dental degrees from the University of Sao Paulo, a DDS in 2012, and had her master's degree in oral science in 2015 and a PhD in oral science in 2017. And as a part of her doctoral studies, she worked as a research fellow in angiogenesis laboratory at the Dental School of University of Michigan and won first place of Patton Award, IADR, Brazilian Division. Her main areas of research are stem cells and molecular biology of oral cancer. Currently, she's a graduate student in periodontology and has received an in initial journal uh, Donald Kerr endowed scholarship in periodontics and oral medicine from University of Michigan. So I just want to say welcome to the dental webinar series, Dr. Natalia Diandraji. Hi, Ali. Thank you so much for this nice introduction. Uh, I'm really happy to be here this morning and share um, a little bit of what I have been learning during these years studying dentistry, uh, autopathology, and also periodontics. So I'll share my screen here. Are you able to see? Yes, it's good. Go ahead. Okay, good. Um, so today I want to talk. Oops, just a second. It's not appearing for me. Okay, here we go. Um, so today I want to talk. I want to. Oh, my mouse is not working. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about, um, my topic is orthodontic assisted GBR and phenotype modification therapy for implant site development. Uh, what I, I want to talk with you guys is when we put together periodontics and orthodontics to solve more complex case. So what I do today, I show one of a com uh, one very complex case that I had. And as I go through the case, I will explain uh, some principles and some important concepts that are behind every decision I take in the case. So um, here is a photo of the patient. She's 54 um, years old and she presents with this condition. I'll show more photos later. And we can see that she has um, a vertical bone loss, very pronounced in the lower incisor area. She has uh, she clearly has a periodontal disease, and when she comes to us, she comes telling that she wants to have uh, a beautiful smile back as she used it to have when she was young, before she developed all, um, the periodontal disease and had this uh, sequela present. So in the orthodontic side, what uh, they could do was, of course, the teeth alignment, but they also could help with the implant site development. That's what um, I will show you guys in um, the lecture. And in the periodontic side, we can do the challenge control, what caused that and control uh, this cause to, don't, to actually be able to keep the patient stable because we can do a treatment. And if we don't control the challenge, everything can come back to, to the baseline of the patient. So we don't want that to happen. So first step uh, that we do in the periodontic treatment is control the challenge. Uh, we also work in the implant side development because you lose that um, to central to lower central incisors, and we also talk. We also perform phenotype modification. I will go through that to explain better what it is. So, uh, first part, as I said, is the etiology control. So, what's clearly here, as I said, is that she has periodontal disease. In this case, according to the new classification, we would classify this patient as a stage four grade C. And it means stage four, uh, the staging of the new classification means how, uh, how aggressive was the past destruction. 
so how much the periodontal disease destroyed uh, the tissues around uh, around the tooth, how much of bone was destroyed, how much of tissue was destroyed. And then in this case, we can see that it's very aggressive for her age. Uh, she has actually, she had actually a lot of, of loss of tissues for her age. So we consider her as stage four grade C, there is actually the more, more aggressive stage and more aggressive grading because it was a lot of destruction in a short period of time. Uh, and another, um, Another factor that uh, led to this situation was the tooth migration. She probably had a, di a diastema before, but it became way worse over the time. And it happened because the tooth moved of the, of the original position. And in her case, it was uh, going through her medical history and questionnaire. We uh, identified that she had burning mouth syndrome. Uh, that's a, a disorder that the patient without a specific reason, it starts to feel like the, the, some parts of the tongue or the mouth are burning and it causes discomfort for the patient. And on her case, um, because she was having that in the tip of the tongue, she kept pressuring the tip of the tongue against uh, her uh, lower incisors because that um, make her feel relief. And this movement of pressure on the tongue against a tooth that was losing periodontal due to the periodontitis, uh, that was losing periodontal support, make the tooth get uh, more apart than it was before. So this, that, uh, that's why these were the two main um, problems that we need to address before we, we think about start any kind of treatment on her. So for the tooth migration uh, caused due to the burn mouth syndrome, we prescribed clonazepam. That's a medication that I would say kind of calm the brain and the nerves and it make uh, she, felt, she felt less of the burning sensation in the tip of her mouth, of her tongue. Uh, clonazepam is a uh, benzodiazepine, uh, diazepine medication is actually very strong. So we give it as a mouth rinse. So she was just a topical use. Uh, and in this, uh, this way, she would not feel the side effects of the medication and she would uh, have the benefit of reduce the burning sensation and it actually worked. She took, uh, she used the, the rings for around six months and, and it stopped. And sometimes it come back, we prescribe a little bit more to her. She take for a while, she used for a while and then it, uh, we can keep under control and then she stopped the movement with the tongue too. And the periodontites, we did non-surgical therapy, that's scaling and root planing and also our hygiene instructions to her. And with that, we could keep her uh, stable. I'm periodontic, uh, periodontic, but I don't wanna go, I don't wanna focus this lecture today in the, um, in the treatment of the periodontal disease. I wanna focus more uh, in the bone augmentation that we did together with the um, orthodontics and um, the periodontal surgery. So I will not focus in the treatment of the per, uh, periodontites, but just to let you know that was non-surgical treatment. So um, was basically cleaning and removing uh, the real etiology that was plague uh, and bacteria. We, we keep her stable and under control. Uh, then the second phase was actually once she was under control, what we would do. Uh, initially, when you, when you look at her initial situation, you think, oh, I want to extract, I, I should extract her both central incisors because there are so much bone loss that would be impossible to keep um, this teeth in place, in function, in, in a good way. But then what I invite all you guys to do is thinking outside the box and think about other solutions that we could have uh, and how these two teeth could actually help us to grow bone before they get extracted. And that's what we did. And that's the orthodontic assisted guide bone regeneration that I want to show you guys today. So what we do, we can see in this hydrograph and the show over the time how was um, how, how we proceed. So in, initially, she just had the bite spleen to stop the movement of the teeth. That's the first hydrograph. In the second one, we see that she started orthodontic treatment. And what we did, we start to move this tooth to the mesial. So we start to create bone interproximally. You can see here in the first one, it was thinner the bone, and then here the bone is start to become uh, to have more weed, and that's very important. I will show you later uh, why this is so important, but it definitely helped in the outcome of the of the procedure. And then when we go to the this last um, 
PA, we can see how much bone we were able to grow. At this one, we, we also end up extracting, um, extracting number 24, uh, one of our recent sizes, because it was also with endo infection, it was um, uh, hard to control uh, and, and, and let it be stable. So we prefer avoid um, further loss and, and increase infection. So this one we need to extract. But um, 20, uh, 25, we were able to move for some months, almost a year, and create this bone. And then you can see how is smaller is the bone defect here compared with how would be the bone defect if we remove, if we extract these two uh, teeth at once without do the uh, mesial movement with the um, uh, orthodontic treatment to create this, this bone. And then that's the condition here in the lower picture that we had after um, one year, almost one, uh, almost one year of orthodontic treatment, closing the space and, and um, me, um, move the tooth to the mesio to, to create more bone. So we can see that with the orthodontic treatment, we are able to remove to reduce a lot of the defects. So the first solution that would be extract this two teeth would actually cause a lot of problems long term and make the um, the outcome of possible bone augmentation very very unpredictable and not that not that good. So after we performed uh, when we arrive at this point that. Uh, we perform uh, the orthodontic treatment for almost one year. We arrive at the point that, okay, we cannot move more. This still, uh, this still, uh, the patient was complaining that was difficult for her to perform oral hygiene because the tooth was with mobility, was almost um, uh, out already of the, the, the bone housing. So that was the moment we decided, okay, now we will perform the guided bone regeneration. And what's guided bone regeneration? So when we have a bone defect, we can uh, grow some bone, adding bone graft, uh, like in this picture here, but we need to pay attention to some important concepts. Uh, we have the bone cells uh, from the patient that will um, replace this bone graft by the real bone of the patient, but we also have epithelial cells and connect tissue cells that are present in the flap that we that are present in the tissue of the flap that we open. So these cells, the epithelial and the connective tissue cells, they actually grow way faster than the bone cells. It, and it, that's simple to, to understand, it's simple to think about it. If you have a cut on your skin, it will heal quick. If you broke a bone, you take a while, you need to use, uh, uh, you need to stop the bone and don't move the bone for some months until the bone can grow and regenerate again. So bone always take way longer time than epithelial and connect tissue to grow. So if we close this flap in the top of the bone graft, what will happen is that the bone graft will absorb and the tissue of the flap will grow in the space that we're supposed to have bone. So what we do to avoid that, we use a membrane and there are different kinds of membranes, and I will go through that a little bit later, but you use a membrane, so you, you isolate the bone graft and the, um, and the native bone from the epithelium. And this way, you create, uh, you, you, you give time for the bone to grow without being invaded by the epithelial cells. So that's why we call guided bone regeneration. The guide means you are, you are guiding what kind of cells you, you grow, you, what kind of cells you have space to grow. So once we decide that was the moment to do the guide bone regeneration, we, we first did the extraction of the lateral incisor that was helping, of the central incisor, sorry, that was uh, helping us to create the bone because uh, as I told before, it was difficult for the patient to clean. We can see they still have some inflammation and some infection. There is calculus, there is bacteria. And for the guided bone regeneration to actually work nice, we need to make sure that it's completely clean. It's a, a, a stereo environment as much as we can. So what we did, we performed the extraction. And as soon as we could, when we saw that the tissue was, um, was healed, we we did the, the bone the bone augmentation and then we use her uh, natural tooth to as a, a temporary attach it to the um, the brace uh, so she still have um, uh, 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 a 
tip there and she keep doing the, the orthodontic treatment in the sense to close as much as they could um, that space. So um, to do the guide bone regeneration, we took a CBCT and we also did the analysis of the two lateral uh, incisors that uh, is still there to see how, how they look like, if they were healthy, if it was worth to keep it there and after all this treatment, or orthodontic movement and everything. And what we saw is that uh, in the cross-section of the CBCT, we can see that both the, her both lateral incisors are lacking the buccal bone. Uh, they don't have um, they don't have buccal bone to to support. They have like one millimeter, not even that. And then we get in a concept that is very important that is called phenotype. Phenotype is uh, is how we characterize the tissues around the tooth. We can characterize as a thick phenotype or a thin phenotype. And including in, inside the phenotype, we have. Uh, the keratinized tissue, we have the gingival thickness, we have the alveolar bone thickness. And in this case, we can see that the phenotype is not health at all. Uh, she has a very thin phenotype because she doesn't have the bone, uh, the bone, the bone plate here. And uh, she, she lost the, 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 the buccal bone plate. So we also need to take in consideration that would be beneficial for this patient if we can uh, recreate all these um, parts of her um, phenotype and recreate the bone in that area. And then is when we have the phenotype modification therapy that I talked in the beginning, uh, that is exactly that. She has in this case a thin bone phenotype. Uh, I would say not just thin, but almost uh, not exist, uh, the bone there. So you recreate this bone and uh, make the environment for the tooth for uh, her teeth more uh, health. And it's normal in patients that had uh, the pass through uh, orthodontic treatment to have this kind of situation. And as in her case, it still needed more orthodontic treatment. It still, uh, you do a bone graft in the area. So it's indicated we try to regenerate the bone in, in around this tip too. So we, um, the, the, just talking a little bit more about what's the, um, the phenotype modification before we go um, through actually the, how we did the procedure. Uh, when we do phenotype modification, in this case, what the patient need is hard tissue grafting. So she need bone graft. But some patients, they have the bone. What they don't have is the soft tissue. So we do soft tissue graft. We just need to make sure that the patient has the uh, enough dimensions of soft tissue and hard tissue to keep uh, a good support for the teeth. Um, and the clinical benefits of do that is that when we do that, we can actually help to accelerate the, orthodon the um, orthodontic movement. Uh, we can show a lot of research show that when we do phenotype modification, we can short the treatment time because we create some little traumas in the bone doing perforations that help once the, uh, the body try to um, heal these uh, little traumas we cause, uh, it helps the, 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 the tooth movement to be faster because you uh, get the turnover of the bone faster because of these little traumas we created. And it helps to expand the scope of the incisor movement because uh, as we create more bone, you have more space to move, um, to move the lower incisors in this case and also enhance post uh, orthodontic stability as we create more support for that, uh, for this teeth, they will, have, they will be more stable over the time in the final position of the orthodontic treatment. And uh, two things we need to take in consideration, what are the side effects of the phenotype modification therapy and what are the indications? So the side effect is that you can have some recession. Once you open a flap to add bone graft, you can uh, end up having a side effect of have some recession. But as I, us I us show you in, in the case uh, I started in the beginning, I show the, the surgery and the follow-up now, the recession is very minimal. Consider the benefits that you have. So, but you need to take in consideration that and talk with the patient that it's possible you have some recession and if the patient is fine and explain the, the, the bad and the good side. Uh, and what are the indications? 
then um, continues with the, the fault of the recession. If the patient there is no is not in need to do orthodontic treatment or the orthodontic treatment will be minimal, or the patient has a thick phenotype, you don't need has a thick bone, uh, a thick soft tissue. You don't you don't need to make the patient pass through that just as um, preventive. You no, know, there is no need. But in cases like this one that the patient you already have uh, bone augmentation done in the area, then definitely the patient can get. Um, benefits of also perform the phenotype modification at the same time. Uh, in patients that already present a lot of recession prior to start the orthodontic treatment, definitely it's a good idea to do the phenotype modification and avoid these recessions to get um, even worse. So the treatment plan for this patient is do vertical and horizontal uh, guided bone augmentation because she's losing in height and she's losing in width too. Uh, and together with that at the same time, do the phenotype modification therapy for the lateral incisor areas. And after that, we also perform uh, connect tissue graft and in implant placement um, to reestablish her, her smile. So now let's go to the surgery. So that was the initial condition. And then we need to look that with attention to decide how we will do our incision design. And what we need to, to take in consideration for that is first, uh, does the patient have keratinized tissue? And then in her case, she has on, on her, um, on, on the adjacent area, but exactly in the area of the surgery, she, she does not have a very good quality of soft tissue. In general, uh, if it's a normal case, let's say like that, a regular case, and the patient is lacking uh, KG, I would first do a frigidivo graft and improve the KG. And then after that, I would uh, actually perform the bone augmentation. But in, in this case, if we wait that, if we wait that long, we would uh, lose that bone we created here. Uh, moving the, the central incisor measly. So as we didn't want to lose that bone, we decided to go ahead directly with the surgery and try to recreate this KG during the surgery. And if need, as I told, I would do um, a graft later for that. Uh, so when we plan the incision design here, we need to, we would go in the middle of the crest, but then what I did, I did a little bit uh, more lingually, uh, I, I placed a little bit more lingually, so we, I could take all this K KG to to the flap and help uh, and it help with the creation of uh, more more KG and make sure I would have I would have enough KG to grab the tissue when I'm doing the the flap. And we also need to take in consideration the ano anatomic factors we have here. So we have the mental forum that is on. Um, in the X, X between the premolars or in the top of the premolar, uh, one of the premolars. So we didn't want to extend this flap too much. And to don't extend this flap too much, we need to make sure that the patient has an open depth. So if the patient that is uh, an open depth, we can do a more conservative flap because we have an open flap uh, movement because the patient has an open um, depth. If the patient doesn't have an open enough depth, then we we need to extend more and then the, the position of the forearm would be more um, tricky, but in this case was was fine. So here is the flap open. As I told, we didn't need to go, um, we, need, we didn't need to extend too much because she has enough uh, depth here uh, that uh, allowed us to, to move this, this flap. And as you can see, we have, uh, uh, even with the orthodontic movement, we still have, uh, a vertical defect and uh, a horizontal defect too that would not uh, allow us to place implant at the same time. And we can see here how much bone we were able to grow uh, keeping uh, that tooth longer time and moving easily. So here what we do, uh, we do uh, first the little perforations that I told you, as you see, it's very small perforations and all around. Uh, this will help us with two points. First one, you give us more blood supply. What's very, very important when you're doing um, bone regeneration is make sure that the graft you put there, you have um, uh, nutrients and cells that come from the blood. And also it's important, as I told before, for the orthodontic movement too. It will accelerate the orthodontic movement. We still want this 
um, roots here get more close together and and help us to close that space uh, so the the little perforations can cause the little trauma that I told before and help with the movement and here I also placed um, a non-absorbable membrane on uh, this titanium hang force that you show more later. I show better pictures later of the membrane uh, that you help us to keep the, the space for the bone graft. And then here uh, is the bone graft I use. So for this case, I choose to use autogenous bone from the patient that will be moved from the chin of the patient as, as I open the flap, I go inside and I uh, take some bone from the chin area, and I mix with xenograft. Um, I will go through the kind of bone grafts we have, so if you don't know this terminology, you explain. Um, but we basically do half-half. I, I did half-half, and that's normally how I do it in cases like that. Uh, it's half um, a bone from the patient and half bone uh, bone graft from this, this case is bovine, bovine bone. And I also mix with Gene 21, that's um, a biological material that have growth factors and can uh, help with the can help with the healing, can help uh, to heal fast, to attract the cells that uh, that you be uh, that you create the bone, and I will go through the biological material later too. So I just wanted to show here that this mix of bone I put in the area of the defect. I close the membrane using a titanium pin. And then I add more bone graft in the sides, covering that root recessions that we have um, for the phenotype modification. For the phenotype modification, we don't need to cover with a membrane. But when we are um, trying to gain um, the bone height and bone width for the implant side development, then we need to cover with the non-absorbable membrane. But uh, for the phenotype modification, what the studies show is that uh, you don't need to cover, you just need to place the bone graft there. And then now I will explain a little bit more about the kind of bone grafts. So uh, we have different sources. And for this kind of procedure, for uh, guided bone regeneration, there are uh, three main sources of bone that we can use. Autogenous, that means it's from the patient. Uh, xenograft, that means it's from a different species. So we use um, normally bovine or porcine bone. And we have also allograft, that means it comes from the same species, but another individual. So uh, that's cadaver bone that passed through a uh, sterilization process and we use as a bone graft. And uh, these grafts, they can have three different um, properties uh, that I will go through these properties and explain exactly which one of them has uh, this property. So first property is B, Osteogenic. Osteogenic means that the bone graft itself has cells that you form bone. So the, the bone graft has osteoblasts. And the only one that have this property is the autogenous bone, the, the bone that comes from the patient. So once you remove bone from the chin, like in this case, you are bringing the osteoblasts that were there to the area that you want. And these cells are still alive. So they will be able to start to grow bone right away in the new area they are placed. And only autogenous bone has uh, this property. Another property that is very important is a bone graft to be osteoinductive. Inductive means it will induce the cells to differentiate in osteoblasts. So uh, we have uh, thin cells and uh, less differentiated cells that are all around. Uh, the, the, the period we have in the periodontal, we have in the, in the, in the X of the roots, we have different sources, uh, we have in the bone itself, cells that are there quiet and they can, they have the potential to become osteoblast and start to produce bone. But for them to pass through that, they need some proteins to kind of tiger this process to start. And these proteins I call bone morphogenic proteins. And then some kind of grafts, they have these proteins present there. And autogenous have this, so our own bone have this kind of proteins that tiger the cells to become osteoblasts and start to produce bone. And allografts too, uh, so the bone that come from cadavers, they don't have live cells, but they still have the proteins that once it's uh, in contact with our blood, also once it's in contact with our bone, can induce the cells that are there to 
become osteoblasts and you start to produce bone too. So autogenous and allograft are the kind of grafts that have this property. And the last property that is very important is be osteoconductive. Osteoconductive means that the bone graft you serve as a scaffold. Because as you saw in the picture I showed before, the, the, the bone in fact is huge. So we need to make sure that this bone graft, you, you, keep, uh, you keep the structure that you want to create, that you keep the format that you want to create. And this property, all the bone grafts I'm talking about now, all of them have, uh, but uh, we need to take in consideration that autogenous bone, he has this um, prophet, but he's not too good on that because it will be absorbed very quick by our, our body. Because it's our own bone, it will be integrated and absorbed very quick. While xenograft bone, that's the bone that comes from other species, from uh, bovine or porcine normally, uh, it needs to pass through a process to become stereo and we be able to use in humans. And this process makes this bone um, be less absorbable because of the heating and the whole chemi chemistry, the whole chemistry that needs to be done uh, for this bone to be used. It actually become less absorbable. It takes more time for our body to absorb this bone that comes from other species. So it makes it better to keep the structure because as you not be absorbed, you actually keep the format that we put the bone there. And that's a good quality of the, of the xenograft. So um, by what I told until now, you can guess that no, none of the bones are perfect. None of the kind of bone graft we have, they are perfect. So what we need to do, we need to mix them. That's why I showed the picture before showing that I put 50% of one kind of bone and 50% of other kind of bone. Because then we have the best quality of um, both bone grafts working in favor of uh, our bone augmentation. So for this case that we need vertical bone augmentation also, it's even more critical. Uh, we mix different materials to actually get the best outcome. When it's horizontal augmentation, we also do that, but it's less critical. When it's vertical, it's even more important we be able to keep uh, this uh, history is structure um, to have the, 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 the amount of bone we need at the end. So three points are very important. We always need to follow this. Uh, the, we always need to make sure we have these three happening. We need to have bone form cells that you come from the autogenous bone. That's why we need the autogenous bone in this case. We need to have a space maintenance and a rigid structure. So we need a bone graft that is also able to keep that um, that format and uh, exclude the epithelial cells and let the bone um, to be created. So that's why we use autogenous particulate bone that have the bone form cells. We also have BMPs that, that proteins the tiger, uh, the, osteoblast, uh, the cells to become osteoblasts. And you have xenograft that you help to maintain the space and you serve as a very good scaffold. And together with that, we use a membrane. When it's vertical augmentation, you need to use a non-absorbable membrane. If it's horizontal, you can use a, a membrane that you absorb in one month or so. But for vertical bone augmentation, we need to wait a healing of around six to eight months. And then all this time, we need to make sure the membrane, you keep the, um, the epithelial cells away from the bone graft and let the bone graft to um, the body to absorb the bone graft and create a new bone in the area. And in this case, we also use the titanium reinforced membranes because the titanium, you actually you will help even more to keep the shape that we want, especially because we are using half of autogenous bone. And as I said before, the autogenous bone, you will be absorbed by, uh, by our body very quick. So it's important we have this titanium part that you actually help us to keep the shape of the bone that we want. Um, and in this case, as I showed before, I also add some um, PGGF. Um, PGGF is pilot driven um, growth factor, and as the name say, have uh, the name says, have a lot of growth factors. And these growth factors, you do a similar um, thing that the BMPs does. Uh, it will uh, stimulate the cells to proliferate. So you stimulate. 
uh, new osteoblasts to form and uh, new bone to be formed. And also we will stimulate the blood vessels to form. So you have more blood supply uh, in this new bone that is being formed. And the literature, different authors show uh, the successful application of PDGF in regeneration actually helping in the outcome. Uh, and commercially it's styled as Gene 21, that's the commercial name. Um, but what's really inside is, um, is the PDGF. And we have other kind of biomaterials that can have a similar effect. We have PRF, that's a palate rich um, fibrin that also have growth factors. And you have a very similar, let's say like that, uh, um, action in, in the site of the surgery. And we also have BMEPs, that's the bone um, morphogenic proteins that are also uh, isolated uh, and you can uh, add in the area. But what uh, is still a little bit uh, scarce, the literature showing the application of all these, all these materials, but PGGF is the one we, we, have, um, we have the most for this specific case that, uh, that include vertical augmentation. And then here uh, are the last steps in the surgery. So what I did here, I put a collagen membrane uh, that is absorbable. You can see the difference between an absorbable membrane that is like transparent, is collagen, and the membrane that is under that, uh, that's the non-absorbable and it's thicker and you actually stay there the whole time. Uh, but this collagen membrane I put here uh, soaked with the Gene 21 uh, that's the PGGF, because you have growth factors, and these growth factors can help also in the soft tissue healing. So do you remember I told before that I wanted to try to create some caging in that area, so I did my flap design thinking about that, uh, placed more lingo, and I also did this step here to try to um, improve the quality of the soft tissue, as we couldn't do the fringe tissue graft um, prior to the surgery. I'm placing this uh, collagen membrane with growth factors to help the soft tissue to heal faster and better. And here is the, uh, is the sutures closely. And one fact that is important, before I suture, before I close, I release the flap a little bit. So I cut the periosteum here uh, in this area and I make the flap more elastic. So I close it without tension. And close the flap without tension and a lot of things that I said until now, uh, are summarized in a principle that we call PASS principle. Uh, so PASS principle is P from primary closure, A for angiogenesis, and S from sp for space maintenance, and S from stability. So I put here the photo of uh, one moment I applied each one of these principles. There are principles then, uh, that are extremely important to make your um, guided bone regeneration to work. So primary closure, as I said, I did the flap without tension and I closed in a way to make sure that all the edges were together and I would have primary healing. Why that's important? Because if you have secondary healing or if you have, if you have secondary healing, you can have more chances of infection. And if you have tension, the flap, you kind of compress the bone and you not allow the bone to form. We know for the orthodontic knowledge, for other knowledge, if you compress bone, uh, you have osteoclasts coming there to, um, uh, to absorb the bone. So we don't want any kind of compression because we don't want the osteoclasts, we want, we want the osteoblasts to create new bone. So free of tension and make sure you have primary closure. I think they are like extremely, extremely important uh, when you're doing this kind of procedure. Then we want to have angiogenesis and that's why I, one of the reasons I create the role so you have more blood supply. And space maintenance, I went through that a lot, explaining that we need to have, we need to have the xenograft to give the bone support and also the titanium reinforced membrane that you give the shape that we want. And also this membrane not absorb, non-absorbable, so you keep the epithelial cells away from the area and let the bone grow. And instability, here is the photo of the post-op showing that during the, the healing time, we need to leave the area quiet. So the patient cannot be using a temporary that is disturbing the area or uh, things like that. That's why we keep the temporary attached to the brains and not, we didn't try to do anything that could pressure 
or open the healing or anything like that. And then <clears throat> this is the photo of the two weeks post-op. And we see already how uh, is better the quality of the soft tissue compared to how it was before. We can see how much we gain putting together the orthodontic treatment with the GBR. That's why the orthodontic assist the GBR because the GBR alone in this case maybe would not be able to create enough bone if you just uh, would not maybe no would not be able to create enough bone if you just extract this um, two teeth. And uh, here we can see the PA before we start and after showing uh, the pins, the titanium pins, the titanium uh, uh, reinforcement and uh, the particles of the bone graft. And then one thing is very important when we are talking about GBR is that we have a limitation of how much we can grow. We just can grow in height until the height of the bone in the adjacent teeth. So here we have, in the, in the, following the middle, we can see where is the adjacent teeth bone level, and that's the space we fill with bone graft. If you place more bone graft than that, you absorb and it's not going to work. And that's because we need blood supply. We need uh, the angiogenesis to make the bone, the bone graft become real bone. And it comes in this area, if you come basically from uh, the, the bone, the bone that is the, the native bone that is there. So the native bone all around has um, blood vessels that you bring osteoblasts, you bring nutrients, you bring growth factors. So we cannot grow bone more higher than the bone in the adjacent teeth. And that's why it was important. We have the orthodontic assistant, uh, assist, we do orthodontic assist at GBR because the orthodontic treatment create the high to us. If we just extract this two teeth, we would, we would lose this interproximal bone to the same level uh, of, uh, or a very similar level of the, um, uh, the bone in the, in, the interpro in the interproximal area between the two that would be extracted, and it would be really, really hard to grow in height. But as we keep, uh, we prolong the, the, the amount, we, we increase the amount of bone, we were able to increase more in height that we would if we just extract the tube. So that's why the orthodontic assisted therapy was really, really important in this case. And then here I have the CBCT of the six months post-op to show the difference. So that was the initial CBCT. And then here we can see how much bone we grow. Uh, you still have the tax and you still have the titanium um, reinforced membrane in place. And we can see how the particles of the graft are being um, replaced by the by real by 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 bone from the native um, patient um, from the patient. And we can see the the last tag I placed was very close to the end of the ridge. And we can see that we had around five millimeters, four to five millimeters of bone that was created in height. And we also increased the width, and now we have around six millimeters. Um, in the beginning, I forgot to show, but we had around two, two and a half millimeters, and now we have six. Uh, bone width is all, always easier to gain. Bone height is more difficult, um, but we, we gain five millimeters, what's considered very, very good. And uh, we have more than enough play, space now to place an implant. With six millimeters width and 12 millimeters high, we have enough space to place an implant. And here are the CBC, uh, is the CBCT of the lateral incisor and that we did the phenotype modification. And as we can see in the first one, that was um, before the surgery, we didn't have the buccal bone. And here is after the six months healing that we can see that we gain in height and also in width. And the bone looks funny, let's say like that, because the healing is not completed yet. Uh, normally we wait six months, but for this case, we wait, um, in some specific case, we wait a little bit more. We, we wait uh, around eight months, especially when we use xenograft, because it takes so long to be absorbed by the body, and sometimes it's just never absorbed, that uh, take a while until the healing is um, completed. So in this case, it's better we wait a little bit more and make sure the bone uh, is more hard, is more stable, is more uh, mature. 
And the next steps for this case, we would probably do a connect tissue graft. Uh, we would do a fringe graft, but we actually gain KG. Uh, uh, we improve the quality of the soft tissue. So we do more for aesthetic reasons to achieve the high that we want and uh, the crown doesn't look too long. We will finalize the orthodontic treatment now. What should happen quick after the, the procedure because we just need now to approximate a little bit more. And then we place the implant and the final restoration. So all this case is very long. Uh, I'm, uh, I just finished my second year in residence. I'm starting my third year and I did this case during residency. Um, just the orthodontic treatment took around one year. So I don't have the final outcome yet, but I would be happy to come here and show uh, in a few months what we did next in the patients. That's uh, the last phase of the treatment. But I thought it was interesting to show how um, the how was nice, uh, how was better uh, the bone augmentation outcome doing together with uh, orthodontic, uh, orthodontic treatment. And that's my, um, part of my final considerations. The interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach in challenge cases always make you have a better outcome. It's nice, like I was watching the lecture before, uh, before mine from Brian and it was really nice to see uh, the pros view, and I do the same. I do the same thing. Uh, I do the same kind of planning, but I have the periodontal view. So when we put two uh, specialists together, or even more, um, three specialists together to solve one case, um, we can always have a better outcome because we have a lot of minds thinking. Uh, and this was the case. We had orthodontic, periodontics, and we also have pros together to uh, decide what's the best for the patient and have a better outcome. Uh, a third, a second point that is important is know the principles of the technique. As I said, uh, as I said during the class, there was there are a lot of principles behind. There were a lot of thinking process behind every decision I take uh, during my my surgical procedure and even prior and after the surgery. So it's important we understand all these principles in deep. We need to understand the biology of the body in deep. Um, and another point that is very important, and I talked in the beginning, is remove the etiology, or at least control the etiology. I could do all this treatment in the patient. If we don't control the periodontal disease, if we don't keep the patient in maintenance, uh, and uh, being able to control the challenges. And if we don't control the burning mouth syndrome, she would keep pressuring her teeth, and we can fix everything in a few years, she would have a similar situation again. So this is, um, these are all very important points, and these three points are the ones I would like to uh, really pass the message um, to everybody. And uh, it was that I'd like to thank you, everybody, um, that stayed here with me, and I'm open to any questions. I also put here my Instagram and my email. You can contact me um, through both, uh, both ways. I'm very open to talk and discuss cases and also answer any questions you have. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that very exquisite presentation. Anyway, I'll be following up that case, and if possible, <laughs> uh, I'll be there too. Uh, do you know who the restoring dentist is? Uh, so who is the restoring this case is Dr. Mendonca. Okay. Okay. So I'll, I'll be in touch with him to see how we can you know, take a look at that case as you finish it. Anyway, because we're, we are still here. You have uh, one, uh, two more years, right? Yeah, I still have one more year. One more. <laughs> I don't want to add to it, okay? <laughs> no problem. Uh, you know, so we have a question, a question from Dr. Dr. Pandya from India. Uh, she says, uh, how did you stabilize the pin on the buccal side of the membrane since it was, uh, since it was particular bone over the defect? Yeah, um... I'm reading here the question. Yeah, so I can go back in the, oops, I can go back in the, in the slide. Oh, it's not working to go back. So, uh, but basically I put in the very end of the, of the crest. Oh, here, here we go. Um, let me try to, I uh, hear. Uh, as you can see, in the very top of the crest, uh, I still have bone structure to, play, to place the pin. It was not easy. Uh, and normally, I would place two pins in the, in the buccal side, but I placed just one, exactly because we didn't have enough bone. Uh, 
to to stabilize the the the, the flap. If you look at the photo of the surgery, the first two in the beginning, when I show the here, oops, I pass them. Here, I basically place the pin here. And uh, I, in the lingual side, I place like around here and around here. But here, I would not have um, bone to, to stabilize, as, as he said, he, he's right. So I placed one pin on exactly here in the very, very end of the crest. And that was enough to stabilize the, for this area. As this area was the main area, I wanted to place the pin uh, making sure the pin would secure the bone up to the, the area. And it worked well. Uh, we can see in the CBCT later that, oops, we can see at the CBCT here that the pin is exactly at the very end. And then the, all the bone we gain is upper to the pin in terms of height. We gain around five millimeters upper to the, the, the position of the pin. Okay, nice. So there's another question from uh, Dr. Mustafa. Can you see? Um, yeah, uh, I just seen the presentation. Oh, gosh. How was the autogenous bone harvest from the chin? Did you use a bone scraper? Did you harvest? Yeah, so I use a bone scraper. Uh, there are different ways we can harvest the bone. And um, I prefer use the bone scraper because I think it's more delicate. I think the patient feel less the, the stress of you remove a whole block. The healing is better and the, the patient experience during surgery is better. Some, a lot of times we do the surgery with IV sedation. So the patients are sleeping, but this surgery I did with the patient awake. And most of my surgery I actually do with the patient awake. Uh, maybe because of uh, background from Brazil that we can, dentists there cannot do AV sedation. So I'm used to do without, and I try the most I can do the surgery, a uh, uh, good experience for the patient. Uh, and I think when we use the bone scraper is less traumatic than we move uh, a whole graft. And also in this case, was good to shape the bone the way I wanted because I had the bone in, in little particles and the scraper will give us bone in little particles. It make um, easier to shape in the format we want. We just need to make sure, as I said, to keep the shape we want. We will have a membrane with titanium and we will have uh, some xenograft together. So you keep the, the, the shape, the stability of the shape. All right. Uh, do we have any more questions out there? Um, I think I have one more. Could PRP has a place in the management of this interesting case? Yes, uh, we could, instead of use the gen 2 one we could use PRP. Uh, actually, I would use PRF. PRP are, um, uh, PRF, I would say it's more, it's palate reaching fibrin and it's more uh, advanced, let's say like that, you would release more growth factors. That's what uh, the, um, the research have show, have show. And I think it would be possible to do, uh, instead of use the um, uh, Gene 21, use the, the PRP would be a solution. Was just my choice um, due to the easy management because the PRF we need to remove blood from the patient and process the the, um, the centrifuge and uh, separate the, 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 the PRP or the PRF and while the GIN21 it comes ready in a syringe so as we do a red B a uh, long procedure I thought was easier we just use some material that is ready and the research show good results. All right. If we do have any more questions, please let's. Um, I think there's one more question here about how do you secure. I, I don't know if you've answered that. How do you ensure the stabilization of the. I think it's the same question. Right? Yeah, this is the one I answer. I have another one here. What factors guide your decision to use uh, substitute bone? Uh, that's what I said. I use a mix of autogenous and uh, substitute bone and to get the best qualities of each kind. 
So autogenous bone is really good as a source of cell and a source of proteins, but it's not a good uh, source for stability. So I would not, the, the, the autogenous bone get, um, can you listen to me? Yes, go ahead. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, the autogenous bone can, uh, is absorbed very quick uh, and it would not keep the shape that I needed. So when we are doing vertical augmentation, it's always better, not just for horizontal too, it's always better if we mix the autogenous bone with the bone from the patient with a xenograft bone. Because the xenograft, as I said, he passed through a process that uh, make it uh, harder to be absorbed. So you keep the, the structure. Okay, one more question here. Uh, in case of GBRI, what steps do you take to avoid membrane, membrane exposure during um, healing? Yeah, this is a very nice question and very important. Uh, when I talked about the past principle, the first one is P, that's primary closure. You need to make sure you close the flap uh, very well and you don't have tension in the flap. And for that, what I do before I close, I do... Um, a little cut inside the flap. Let's suppose this is the flap, this is the outside, and that's the inside. I do a cut in the periosteum, uh, like half a millimeter, I would say, in the periosteum, like one straight cut in the periosteum. And when you, once you cut the periosteum that is connected to the flap, the flap becomes flexible. So you can uh, close without tension. That's the main trick to avoid exposure. Um, I actually learned that with Dr. Urban. I had a chance to do a surgery with him here and he showed me how he was doing the cut and I do exactly the same way for all my flaps and I never had an exposure and in everything I did in residency and I really think it's because of that. You need to make sure you, you, cut, you cut the periosteum and then after that for the sutures I do one horizontal mattress to release the tension and bring the flap together. And then I do a sever of simple interrupted around to make sure it's tight together, like the, the ads are very close. All right. Any more questions? We are ready. We are still here taking questions. If you have questions, um, um, uh, my, my professor, Natalia Diandraji, is going to answer. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. She's just um, done a very, 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 very good. This presentation is going to be available on YouTube in a, in, a, in, a, in a couple hours, so you can go back. I know it was, you know, it's a lot to take in, but you can always go back and press rewind and check this and check that. Uh, next, uh, next week, we're going to have Dr. Gudeka back on digital dentures. The week after, we're going to have Dr. Uh, Shiva Stava and Dr. Uh, Ek uh, Fasuk. And um, we have a pathologist coming on the 31st. We have also a lecture on veneers coming. Uh, we have um, Carlo Pojo. He's going to be in the house. And you know, we have a couple of uh, our, our lectures already planned uh, coming soon. And uh, it, it promises to be uh, very, very enlightening. I'm really thankful for it. So what's the name of the YouTube channel? So it's, um, if you just type, uh, you type my name, Uvo, it's, it's called the Real Relationships TV. If you type my name, I'll, I can put the link here. Just type my name on there and dentistry to take you uh, it, on YouTube. It will take you right there. You will see some of the ones. The dental webinar series. Um, uh, Dr. Mustafa, where are you from? I'm going to go there. I'm going to go to that uh, Facebook. Uh, Dr. Andrade, are you still there? Yeah. Do you see, is there any, can you see any question? Because my view... Is any, um, any I think I answer all the questions already, but if someone has other questions, as I told you, you can send me by email or you can uh, DM me on Instagram. I, I would be happy to, to answer more questions later. All, all right. Thank you so much. I, want to, I just wanted to let you know, this week has been a trying week. Uh, uh, a couple of days ago, my mother went uh, to be uh, with the Lord and uh, it's been, it's been a, you know, a quite stressful week, but uh, these things are already planned out and I have to have a bold face and um, and <laughs> still continue what we do, but uh, you know this is uh, uh, this is uh, my mom, uh, a beautiful sweet mother who uh, went uh, and to be with the Lord recently. Um, uh, we are still trying to process um, our exit, uh, uh, but uh, 
just to let you guys know, but uh, in the midst of it, uh, I, I, I grieve in one hand, but we're going to continue um, doing what, what we have planned. I think she will be happy for us to continue. You know, she will be happy for us to continue. Um, she was a great supporter of, of this, this program. And um, so, so this is the YouTube. Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator 2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2